So what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Today we're here with Derek and Stephanie Moore, a, a wonderful couple, and they're here to talk to you today a little bit about what they have done. I know Derek, he played in the National Football League. He's also a motivational speaker, and Stephanie has wrote many books, according to what Stephanie has told me, 60 books, and that is a wonderful thing because I wrote one, and how did I find the time? I want to know how did she find the time to write 60. So I want to thank you guys for joining us on the show today. It's our pleasure. Thank you for having us. All right. So, Derek, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you get into sports and everything? Oh, my goodness. You're dating me now. Uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, oh, many years ago, you know, I, of course, like most kids grow up in their community, in their neighborhoods, uh, playing outside sports and running around and competing. And as young boys, that's what we did uh, back in South Georgia. And as a result, as I got older, of course, I've got uh, mentored and pushed a little bit more to uh, play a little bit more organized sports and, and began to partner with the, the middle school and high school. And, and as a result, I, I developed and skills became uh, very prevalent. And there are those who encouraged me even more to play. My mom even encouraged me to play. And so I went out and played for the uh, middle school team and eventually our high school team. And and then uh, I finally got an opportunity to uh, show my wares on a collegiate level and went on to Troy University, uh, where I played actually three years, and but I didn't finish there. I finished at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma, where I finished as an All-American and graduated from there and went on to uh, be selected by the Atlanta Falcons in the uh, 92 NFL draft. All right. So that's, you know, a great thing. So how many years played in the league? Played six years. Six years in the league. Yes. Sir. Oh, okay. So you know, then you got out of the league, and then it was life after the NFL. So what did you do then? Well, that's, that's really good because it is life after the NFL. And, and you know, at some point, that thing comes to an end. Uh, and so, but I've done so much work in preparing for that while I was playing, but I also had ambitions uh, prior to my playing. So I always wanted to uh, be an inspirational and motivational keynote. Uh, for multiple organizations, and I was inspired by someone who uh, was a public speaker. I thought that was something that uh, really spoke volumes to, to me. I enjoy inspiring people, motivating people, encouraging uh, various uh, people groups. And as a result, I was validated by other people who thought I had a skill set that I could certainly transfer uh, into uh, the real world. And so I, I finished playing in, in the National Football League around 97, 98, and, and basically started my own speaking uh, company, if you will. Uh, and as a result of that, I've, I've been doing that since. But also, uh, I work closely um, at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, at the institute over here in Atlanta, where I've been the uh, director of leadership and character development for Georgia Tech football and Georgia Tech athletics. All right. So when did you meet Miss Stephanie here? <laughs> now you're getting into my business. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's sitting there. That's a question. That's right. That's right. Well, Stephanie and I met actually uh, doing, uh, actually, believe it or not, tomorrow, the 28th, we'll be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, indeed. And so her and I met uh, at an all-star game. I was actually playing in an all-star game called the Blue Gray All-Star Game in Montgomery, Alabama way back a thousand years ago. And she was actually a hostess on, and oversaw, she was the director of all the, the young ladies that were hosting and being a part of, of the Blue Gray All-Star Game. And she had just graduated from Auburn University over there in Auburn, Alabama. And, uh, and, and in some strange way, it's hard to put into words, but I think she just took a liking to me. She just saw me and just couldn't help herself. No, I'm kidding, but <laughs> no, not really. But I thought it was very mutual. It was uh, one of those things where, you know, eye contact happens. And and then I did a presentation. I was selected by our team to be the uh, leader for the weekend for our team. And as a result of that, I had to give a speech one night at a banquet. She was present, heard me deliver the speech. And I think that inspired her even more. And then we connected. Hello, how are you doing? That kind of thing. And but we never spoke when the thing was over. I went home. She went home. I didn't talk to her for about four months. Didn't know anything about her. And as a result of that, uh, four months later, uh, we reconnected. And as a result, we, we've been uh, together 25 years and three children. 
<laughs> oh, three kids. That's that is that's <laughs> Stephanie. Now, now we we heard the great story. So, um, he, he says you're a wonderful wife there. Oh, well, I appreciate hearing that. It's always good to hear that God has been good over the years. That's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. So, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, Miss Stephanie. I mean, we know that you wrote a lot of books, but it, we want to know. That I saw you were speaking to middle school kids on the website as well. So, do you, you know, travel and speak along with your husband? We do do some together in schools. Um, it's definitely emp empowering when I'm able to speak with Derek, as well as my dad is a, a school superintendent in, uh, down in South Georgia in Liberty County. So when the three of us speak together in schools, it's really imp important. We call it Operation Re Reach Every Attainable Dream. And we basically believe that young people need to understand and believe that they've got to be motivated, that they've got to feel excited. And when they do, greatness can happen. So we do that with the books some of Derek's story, some of my father's story. And I think together, the trio of us, we can inspire young people there throughout that's in the audience. So you just mentioned your father. Uh, you had a great relationship with him? I did, yeah. So you guys are close even to this day? We are. Derek and I, we're going to see him a little later on today. And he just called me right before we started this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so so do you, do you feel that uh, relationship with your father and, and having a great one had an impact on your marriage? I think so. Um, you know, D Derek is just a dynamic man and father himself um, to the kids. We're, we're excited about our, we just have one left. We had a daughter that just graduated from Mississippi State a, a month ago. Mm -hmm. And our last uh, baby is going to be an upcoming senior at the University of Georgia. So we're excited that the kids are almost out of that education stage and moving into the workforce. Our son is now training and doing some great things of his own. And so to have a, a great father there, I think it's important for every young person to know. My dad used to wake me up telling me it's going to be a great day. You know, what kind of day is it going to be, Stephanie? And I'd have to repeat it. It's going to be a great day. And so it was just a mindset of having the dad around. And my mom was amazing, too. So. I'm grateful to not only have 25 fun years with Derek, but to see him pour so much into the kids, not just our own kids, but young people at Georgia Tech over the years. He was at Morehouse before he was at Tech. And just kids in the community is is always encouraging. We need more of you guys. You do the same thing, Philip. Yes, and, and the reason why what, what caught my attention is because, you know, in our community, we have, you know, a lot of times family issues. And when I heard you said you mentioned your father, and you young lady had your father and then it transitioned to you got married with Derek. And, and from what I've seen just over the years is that, you know, people who had a father in their life, they, for some reason, we are in a better position. Not to say that, you know, if you don't have a dad, you can't, but it just seems like to me, it's a little uh, easier, a little different. Well, I would say active father at that. I absolutely, I, I definitely think, of course, that when the family unit is intact, there are a lot of things that are there. You don't have to go back and try and get. They're just innately there because the father's in the home. The head of the household is, is the way we believe and raise our family. And my dad was there, as, as I mentioned, but his father was there too. So I knew my grandfather growing up. He was a, a minister in, in a, a church. He, we, Derek and I, actually, the day we got married 25 years ago, was my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. They didn't tell us at the time, so we found out that day, but pretty amazing. Both my granddad and grandma have gone on as, as well as you know Derek's father too, but Derek was raised by his mother. So we have a book, one of the ones that Derek wrote, we wrote together, it's called um, Raise, Raise Him Up. Him up. Yeah, Raise Him Up. A yeah. Single Mother's Guide to Raising a Successful Black Man. So that's an exciting book. Derek gives some good nuggets and I come alongside as a wife to, to, to write some things there too. Now you're speaking about writing books. When you wrote, when did you write your first book? So, yep. The story goes back to my dad and Derek. Derek was just starting in the NFL and I had gone from, from Auburn to Detroit. I had interned out in California. So a Southern girl out in California, cause I wanted to do television and film. That was the dream. That was the exciting part. And so it's so fun to be out there. But then we got married and we lived in Detroit. Derek was um, with the Lions at the time. And I was doing so much community service in a sorority and so much stuff with the NFL wives. But my dad said, look, chick, I paid for you to go to school. You better do something. And so I'm like, well, what am I going to do? Look, it's no television and film up here in Detroit. And so that's when the books kicked in. I went into a Christian bookstore and um, I saw that there was a whole section called Christian Fiction. And honestly, Phil, I didn't see any books that looked like me, characters in which I could identify. And I felt like the Lord was speaking to my heart and said, you can write some stories like this. And so the journey began.
You mentioned going to Christian fiction, okay? So, yeah. and you said no one looked like you. Why is that? So I was in a the bookstore, and again, it was a, a Christian bookstore. There, I didn't even realize there was such a thing as fiction. I was reading Terry McMillan on the fiction side, and I was reading Max Lucado on the nonfiction side. And so I went into the Christian bookstore to find another great Christian book, and I did not even realize there was a fiction section. So when I go down that section, I mean, it was wall-to-wall -wall books, you know, from the top shelf to the bottom shelf. But when you picked out any of the books, I found one at the time called A Gown of Spanish Lace. I can remember it to this day from Janet Oakey, and she's a Hallmark writer now. And it's interesting that none of the books just look like me. It was antebellum dresses, and you can imagine where, you know, people, you know, our African-American folks were back in those times. It just wasn't, <laughs> we just weren't on the cover um, of any of those historical books. And I then went around to the youth section and saw a lady named Robin Jones Gunn, and it was amazing. There was 12 books in one series called Christy Miller and 12 books in another series called Sierra Jensen. And they were for teenagers. And at the time I was probably 25, 26 years old, young. And so I felt like I maybe couldn't do an adult book, but I could definitely tackle the, the, the teen. That, that's a place I had already been and could tell some stories. And so I wrote a series called Peyton Scott and it's still selling to this day. My bestseller is book one, Peyton Sky Staying Pure. And it's about abstinence, a young coming of age story of a wonderful young girl that's trying to find her way. Does she please God or does she please a guy? And she makes the right decision to please God. And from there on, you know, the books just kept coming out one after the other. So you got on a roll writing your books. You know, did you find a good editor that you could say, you know what, I trust this person for all 60 of my books or use multiple editors? Well, yep, you, you do use multiple editors along the way. When you're with a publishing company, they have editors for you too. So it's, it, you know, it, a true journey that I love talking to young people in schools because it took me seven years to get the first book published. So it's a big story in between writing the book, you know, being inspired to write the book, doing the research for the book, actually getting it to a publisher and getting it in print. Um, it just wasn't an overnight thing. And so I encourage anyone out there, if you've got a dream, stick to it. It might come instantly, but it might come most of the time. Anything rewarding comes with a whole lot of work, making it to the NFL, you know, or, or writing a, a successful novel. So this is a time before Amazon KDP. That is correct. I, I think there's so many other resources now to folks that want to write a book. And that's why even the market for publishing is a little tougher because, you know, not to say anyone can write one, but anyone can also just get it published self publishing is really big nowadays, um, but it's still a lot of authenticity, I think, when you're published under a brand or under a, a major company. So when you were writing the book and then you have Derek, you know, doing his, um, you know, thing, how did you guys find time for each other? Because when you have so many different things going on, you know, you, you're so busy and you're trying to, you know, pay for college, you know, with the kids, you know, being parents, how did you find the time for each other? Well, you know, the good thing about that is that every day I come home, you know, and and Stephanie comes home. And as a result of that, before the children, uh, you know, we, we obviously spent, uh, you know, the, the bounty of our time together. And we would uh, intentionally, um, you know, plan time together, whether it was home, whether it was uh, on trips or opportunities to go do things in the community together, whether it was visiting uh, other parts of our family, etc. And that continued when when the children uh, uh, arrived. We've just made that an intentional effort, you know, that, you know, if you're going to have a relationship, you've got to, you got to be there. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have a perfect relationship, uh, it, but it does give you the chance to be effective and have effective communication, et cetera. So it was intentional. You know, the way you do uh, anything is the way you do everything just about. And so, you know, our anything was, you know, let's try and make sure that that quality time is there. We didn't always have to, you know, manufacture that or create it. It just naturally happened because you wanted to be together. Yeah, because anyone in here, you know, is listening to this and say, wow, they've been together 25 years. And, you know, in this day and time, that sounds like, a hundred years in this day and time. So, you know, what, what tips do you guys have for anybody that could be listening that's, you know, just married or, 
or a few years married, like you have any tips where they can, you know, look into and say, look, I want to follow that so I can be with my, you know, spouse 25 years. I'll do one at one thing I would say for us, it's something we learned a long time ago is you know, communication is key, but you don't have to win every conversation you, uh, or you don't have to feel like you can lose one. We, we decided a long time ago that we're on the same team. So when she wins, I win. When I win, she wins. And so the reality of it is, is that together we work together to make things happen and, and we communicate effectively. So, so yeah, so it was, it wasn't a battle or a tug of war for, you know, where we're going to go and who's going to win. In the reality, we did what was best for our family and what's best for us. So that's, that was one of the real keys for us or has been. And I think for me, it's don't sweat the small stuff, let some things go. I think a lot of relationships, um, have tougher times because they hold on to things. Not to say that you aren't supposed to deal with what's tough, but you got to be able to appreciate the dialogue so that you can have real conversation and get through some things and move on. Um, a lot of us hold stuff that really when you, people talk, it's like it was so minute. Why didn't we talk that out? Or why was it such a misunderstanding? If you just would have talked it out, you would be able to understand the other person's point of view as well as be able to articulate your own point and then as he mentioned come to a place of, of team and a lot of Derek's strategies from, from sports because I love sports I didn't play it but I love sports and particularly football um, he, we use a lot of those strategies you got to be ready to midstream adjust mm -hmm. and so when things don't work out in life you know we're able to midstream adjust and figure out um, what's going on but with faith I think we've understood that we've got to trust God through it too and when we look back over the life, he, the Lord might not have gotten this or that, but then you look at all the things he has gotten, glass half full, he wins, I win, as he said. I, I love that. Yeah, because the number one you know, reason people divorce, in, at least in the United States, is in the finances. So what advice do you have for people in that area when it comes to money? Well, I, I've always considered myself more of a stay-at-home mom. Um, so I think it's been a little bit more interesting and easier for us than, than some in that regard. Um, as And it's not really the norm a lot in a, a lot of African-American households, quite honestly. Um, so it's been interesting, but it's given me a chance to do the art, to write those books, um, to, for us not to always have to depend on that. We, we worked with one income and the arrest with savings and some other great things. And I, I just think people have to be comfortable with what that team finance is going to look like. And whatever that is, you agree on that and work towards that and share that, whether it's two incomes, whether it's one income, um, just be on the same plan to share it and, and, and share the, the finances. Derek will have a, a speaking engagement that will pop up and we'll talk together on what we're going to do with that. It's not his money or my money. And I think to your point, a lot of people we talk to in council and Derek uh, actually is an ordained minister. So he does so many weddings. And with your counseling, that's the one that always comes up with finances, as you just mentioned, Phil. And, and I would say have that game plan together to work as a team from the beginning. And then that helps you be on the same page going forward. Yeah, it's interesting what you just said about the money aspect, because that's how it is with me and my wife. We don't do all this, my money, your money. And I hear people, you know, saying that, well, I'm not going to let them tell me what to do with my money. And if you're going to go into a marriage with that attitude, it's not going to work. I agree totally. Uh, no, no question. And, and you know, that, that was settled day one of our marriage, though. It wasn't uh, a case of something that we had to get to. So, but I know that works differently depending on who you're speaking with. Uh, but Stephanie handles all of our finances in terms of day to day booking and, and operations and those kinds of things. And, and we have roles that we play when it comes to finances. And so I stay in my lane and play my role and she stays in her lane and plays her and she holds me accountable to mine. I'll hold her accountable to hers. As a result of that, it's worked well for us. So, you know, all decisions, we make them together. But at the same time, we have uh, independent control as well. So there's a trust involved also. Uh, so again, 
and you know it, when it comes to finances everything has to be on the table it can't be you know some over here some over there and i got mine and you have yours and uh, that leads to uh, a, a lot of disenchantment so uh, that that area has to be a, an open book and i think for clarity there's a, a all joint accounts but to, to what he's saying if there's fun money or play money or chopper money or this money or that there, there are other accounts for those things, but then you do with whatever you need to in those smaller accounts. So it's fun to, to talk about finances when it comes to, to marriage. But those other accounts, you guys know what's going on in those other accounts as well, correct? Correct, but not an oversight where it's like, okay, you've got $1,000, what are you gonna do with it? I mean, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, that's your $1,000 have fun. And so hopefully you, you save it or you do whatever, or, you know, there's maybe something else that you might want to get that might not even be important to the other person. But that's the the fun thing that I think is the difference. But those aren't deal breakers when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the mortgage and, you know, the, the cars or the savings and life insurance and some of these other things. Um, that stuff that's nails and hair and tires and, you know, a car shine and, you know, going through the car wash or, you know, you know things like that. Yeah, and then, you know, as parents, you know, talking about the kids, it, it, it's, it seems like today, you know, I know I grew up, you know, in my time period, but it seems like today is a little bit more difficult, just in my opinion, to raise kids in this society because some constraints that we had back when I was a kid versus today is just like, it's just wide open. So how did you guys raise your kids in this society? You know, I I do a presentation around the country called The Lessons My Children Taught Me and and How My Children Raised Us. (laughs) And so really, as we have over the years grown to get to know them, uh, we've identified what their strengths and weaknesses are. We've identified uh, the way they see their world and the way they see our world. And as a result of understanding that perspective, we were able to shape and redefine and reshape the way we live with them and the way we operate with them. So the key for us was to get to know them very well, to get to understand them, uh, that they're very different. Uh, They have their own independence. They see things differently. As a result, we as parents had to operate that way. Uh, and, And so the lessons we've learned from them over the years is, is how to meet them where they are and, and then uh, implement what we need to, to move them from where they are to ultimately where they want to be and where then we would accept them being. And so the results there uh, has helped us uh, grow them into the people that they are uh, by giving them that space to be themselves, uh, but to help identify those uh, real important areas of their lives that they are telling us every day. If you live with your kids, you live there long enough, uh, they'll tell you everything you need to know about them. That's for sure. And as a parent, opposed to me saying, you know, this is what I want you to be and become, we discover what we think they're going to become and what they want to become. And we'll either encourage it uh, and, and or determine how we can help them see something better. All right. So, you know, before, you know, we, we wrap up, um, Derek, do you have any, uh, speaking engagements coming up that people could possibly you know, go check you out at? That's a, a great question. You know, I, I just come off of a couple of engagements with uh, two corporate firms here locally in Atlanta uh, that I just recently did. I have a, a summer schedule that's in front of me where I'll be doing some camps here in South Georgia, speaking at a few uh, coaching clinics, uh, both in middle Georgia and in North Georgia, uh, the month of June. Uh, basically, if anyone wanted to visit any of my engagements, they can go to my website at demospeaks.com and they'll see where I'm going next and where I'm speaking. Uh, and certainly they're welcome to come out and, and take part. Yeah, Miss Stephanie, you have anything coming up as well? Well, we just wrapped up the first season of our show that um, Derek's radio show is called Demo Speaks. So we've been really excited about that. It's a motivational show and I had a chance to produce and put some of those fun television skills to to work as well as working with the local local radio station, WIGO 1570 AM. But those are all on YouTube the first season. And again, it's called Demo M.O. Speaks. And so we've been excited about that, that show. 
Okay, so you producing as well? Yeah, starting to. The ultimate dream is to turn the books into television and film. And so um, being able to work with Derek on his show because he's such a brand and so many people love that he how he motivates them to be able to work with the radio station here that was excited about that, too, and come together. We're, we're hoping to do season two here and in, in, we film in August. OK, so you start. So you're on an AM station and also you are on uh, YouTube or, you know, different platforms, Facebook, et cetera. That's correct. Yep. On Derek's, um, on, on his thing, we've got the Twitter piece going, but if you Google Demo Speaks, they, it should all come up and you can watch live as well. So though it's a radio show, it's our program where he talks to callers, where he gives a motivational moment, where he talks a little sports. So that's pretty fun and cool too. Um, you see the passion just comes out of us when we, we get him on camera and he can do what he normally does when that's inspiring people, but take the brand up another level. Yeah. So what was your, what was your um, most um, watched episode? That's a good question. Uh, I would say at least probably the very first one that that uh, premiered um, uh, several now weeks ago was probably the most watched one. Um, I, I don't even remember the title, the, the theme of the first one, if I remember correctly. So you remember, I can remember. Yep, Taking the Lead. Taking the Lead, yeah. Taking the Lead was um, the very first one. and. That one certainly got some traction, and, and so we began to just build on that. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, you know, we definitely want you to check out the Demo Speaks website, and we'll make sure to put that in the, you know, comment section down there below in the pin section. That way you can go there and check that out. Ms. Stephanie, you have a website for people to go check out as well? Absolutely. Most of my books are for you, so with summer reading, um, and even some of the adult titles, it's stephanieperrymore.com. Okay, make sure we'll put that website as well. Go check it out. And uh, we definitely want to thank both of you for taking out the time today to speak with us. And, you know, you guys have a you know wonderful family, great marriage. It's beautiful to see that, especially in this day and time. And, um, you know, I hope everything go well in your career. And it's, it's great to, you know, see two wonderful people working together. Thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, sir.